успешно.
so that he can have this in mind and be really proud of the place because you need to be proud of your roots because these are your roots this is where you belong to you got all that wonderful history since the war and so on and of course the next seven to five years is even going to be more thrilling because with what you've got behind you've got to live up to it and uh, i'm sure you're going to have an even more interesting time when that's opened um if I, you know if you can come back as a little bird or something on that tree i'm sure you'll be very thrilled uh what these you 75 years have given so i wouldn't say much more because i know you want to be jolly and so on but let's say keep this neighborhood spirit going i i could see it i could feel it keep the spirit going be proud of new addington that's the most important thing you've got to be proud and people all communities black brown white pink yellow come together and work for the good of new addington thank you very much thank you mr mayor uh, we're now going to hand you over to phil john he's going to bless the garden for us just like to follow from what the mayor said is when brothers and sisters live together in unity it is like precious oil poured on the head running down the beard it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion for when people live in harmony there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore Let's pray that this garden will symbolize a community spirit. And you have called us to reflect that love by living together in harmony. We pray that this garden 
born out of our celebration of community, may long stand as a reminder to each of us as the need of the need to live together in unity, to care for those who are weak and vulnerable, to seek peace in place of strife, so that every generation in this neighborhood may come to learn the true meaning and spirit of community. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, I'd like to just say a big thank you to uh, Mr. Mayor for coming up this afternoon and uh, also Phil for his blessing and also all the committee that have put this together. Um, and if you haven't done so, there is a nice exhibition in the Baptist Church. Um, it's on the rest of the day and tomorrow. So if you'd like to uh, pay a visit in the uh, church, you'll see the exhibition of uh, the local community and clubs, etc. Um, after that, the uh, party will be leaving down to the parade, um, where the band will be playing for a short while, and then we'll join the rest of the festivities down at the centre. So thank you very much, one and all, and we'll see you all later.
Listen to me, distant nations, you people who live far away. Before I was born, the Lord chose me and appointed me to be his servant. He made my words as sharp as a sword. With his own hand, he protected me. He made me like an arrow, sharp and ready for use. He said to me, Israel, you are my servant. Because of you, people will praise me. I said, I have worked, but how hopeless it is. I have used up my strength, but have accomplished nothing. Yet I can trust the Lord to defend my cause. He will reward me for what I do. Before I was born, the Lord appointed me. He made me his servant to bring back his people, to bring back the scattered people of Israel. The Lord gives me honor. He is the source of my strength. The Lord said to me, I have a greater task for you, my servant. Not only will you restore to greatness the people of Israel who have survived, but I will also make you a light to the nations, so that all the world may be saved. Fortunate to have Wolsey School Choir here, yeah? and they're going to sing for us three songs. So perhaps they might like to come up. Stand to the bed, mark down a bit, please. Um, when we were planning this whole weekend, uh, part of my vision was that we should have a celebration of Christian worship as part of our community celebrations. I uh, particularly wanted that to be a special occasion and to have somebody very special to share with, with us. And I'm delighted that uh, one such person um, accepted our invitation to join with us. Some of you may have shouted yourself hoarse in the past, encouraging him to uh, score goals for Crystal Palace and probably food in Sydney. More recently, hoping that he wouldn't score goals for QPR. But we're delighted to welcome here today, as part of our service, Dennis Bailey. Please welcome him. You are a professional footballer, which is tremendous. And, uh, I mean, I guess that most young men, uh, I know when I was young, all I ever wanted to do was to play for Liverpool. And, uh, you yeah, know, most of us grow up with that, that dream of what they were going to be a professional footballer and score a winning goal in the FA Cup final. But for very few of us, it actually happens. Now, how did it kind of happen to you? Did you decide you wanted to be a footballer, or did it just happen? Well, I was very young, that's all. I always played football. I got my, uh, my love, and uh, I played most of the time. I played football in the playground, in the street, in the park. And obviously, as you got older, that was the one thing I really wanted to do. So I said, it was one of my dreams as a young child to be a professional footballer. And I was quite fortunate to be uh, spotted and um, playing for a non-league club and to be signed up to the Palace. And you were part of a team that actually got Palace into the Premier Division at the end of the 88 season. That's correct. Um, that was the old first division um, when we had uh, Ian White and Mark White and uh, Steve Cockle for the manager now. Uh, mm -hmm. So you were part of that great time of the Palace history and uh, you liked Palace at the end of that season, didn't you? Um, yeah, because there uh, have been a lot of broken appearances, so I uh, decided to leave. Well, it was quite a shock to the team, wasn't it? It was the first league game they played after you left us against Liverpool. And they got beat 9-0, I think. <laughs> I had to get that in somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I do some more memory lessons. It's, it's, it's like bias on my part. But, so, I mean, when we, when we kind of read about footballers in the paper, it was a very glam life style, and, uh, you know, you kind of uh, loads of money and yachts on the money. Is that what it's like? Um, oh, I wish it was like that. <laughs> um, don't be really interested reading the papers. Um, obviously, football is glamour a lot. And um, especially for young players coming into the game straight away, um, they get a sharp shock to the system because you do have to work extremely hard, especially starting out as a 16, 17 year old. And um, as I said, it's like the media wants to hype it up and um, give it a sort of false picture. But it is very, I won't say stressful, but it's a very difficult job and uh, not just physically but mentally as well. Mm -hmm. Now, as well as being a professional footballer, you're, you're also a Christian. 
You're a member of a Pentecostal church, is that right? right. Yeah. Um, I mean, surely somebody in your position, what, why not be a Christian? Um, well, that, that was easy for me, as um, being a Christian before I actually turned professional. It was easy for me to to to, uh, to enter a club and say I'm a Christian and this is my background. Whereas for a lot of players, it's difficult if they're a professional footballer and they're becoming a Christian because it doesn't sort of mix. But I was I was able to um, go there as a Christian and become a footballer. So I found it quite easy. So you were kind of brought up in church, that was your yeah. Um, as a, from church, so that helped me a great deal. And do you think there's any kind of difference uh, to you being a Christian footballer? Say, has it made any difference to your life? Did you get any? Um, well, I put it into perspective. I mean, I know I'm here for a purpose, and I know that God wants me to serve Him and to help others. So, um, my goals are not exactly the same goals as every other Christian footballer. So how did you come to be a Christian? What does that happen overnight? Was it a great experience or was it a gradual thing? Um, I'll say it's a gradual thing. My auntie, um, who was a former church guy, she always kept inviting me to go to church and always made excuses on me, especially on Sunday, I just take on Sunday as well. So, um, just out of the blue, really, I just decided to go along. And um, once I actually went along and listened to the message, and to me, everything was so plain and uh, like black and white. I heard a message of Christ, He died for my sin, and I had a chance to for forgiveness, for forgiveness. And basically, I just took that step straight away. So um, after that, it was a sort of gradual knowing Christ. And um, from there, I have a look back. Now, I should imagine that's probably got quite a busy life. Yeah. You've got to be on tour, you've got to go to away games, you've got to be in distant places like this, uh, Newcastle, to make sure Les is behaving himself. <laughs> and um, I mean, there can't be a lot of time to go to church and things. Is that what Christianity is about? Because you must find that hard to kind of. Yeah, a few times on Sunday. It's getting more and more difficult now, as you know, we're under playing football on Sundays. We're not playing Sundays, we're um, sometimes training on Sundays. So I do find it difficult. But um, fortunately, we have um, in sport a, a body which, which uh, helps Christian footballers, and we try to meet together at least once a month and to pray and to have fellowship. So it is difficult as a book now to not get to go to church every Sunday. But if you would say that Christianity is about the lifestyle and being a, a Christian as a book rather than just going to church. Exactly. Um, I think it's important that Christians everywhere um, will show themselves no matter what walk of life, whether it's um, working on Sundays or in the hospital or whatever. I mean, I think it's important for Christians to show in their life where, wherever they are. And it doesn't have to be just in church. It could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, here we are. We're watching one of the 16th. Season starts in four weeks. That's right. And, um, so you have to do a break in the moment. Um, well, we've started training already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> training very hard. It's very hard. And um, so what are your hopes for the next season? Well, um, hopefully to get a uh, first team place. Um, I had a hard season last season, but um, things are looking bright. We have a new manager where we're working, a very nice fella. Um, and hopefully, score three goals against Liverpool. Bruce is not there time out to come and uh, share with us today at this very special celebration of Community. And they're going to be around a little bit later, so perhaps some of the younger members want to uh, see him. So you one more question I want to ask you this week. Would you sign my under service? <laughs> no, but we are moving please. And Dennis is going to lead us now in a prayer for community. And but let's before he does that, just give him one more vote of <laughs>
Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to share my testimony. And I thank you, Lord, for for Phil. I thank you, Lord, for people here present, for Christians and non-Christians, Lord. And I pray that they're being touched by what has been said. Lord, I pray for the church this now, for the men united together as one, for your purpose and for this community. Lord, I pray for every man, every woman, every boy and girl, in the youngest babe to the oldest man or woman. I pray, O oh Lord, that your peace and your love may dwell with them, and they may experience your love. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity once more. I thank you for, Lord, everybody in this community. Lord, and I pray that as the church moves forward, they will reflect your love. And that, Lord, they may go towards your gospel. I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Father, in this case, uh, in your word, you have given us the vision of that holy city which the nations of the world bring their glory. Behold, we visit our neighborhoods and communities. Send us honest and able leaders. Help us to eliminate poverty and prejudice, that peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order, that together, we may find the fulfillment of our common humanity. Lord, in your mercy, God, our sustainer, we remember before you people in our neighborhood who are in any kind of need or distress. Help us to work with you to heal those who are broken in body or spirit, so that their sorrow may be turned to joy. Lord, in your mercy, do you O oh God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we pray for people of every race and in every kind of need. We pray especially for the people of Bosnia, who have had to flee from their homes and for others in the former Yugoslavia who are suffering because of war. We pray too for those in countries forgotten by the media, for refugees from Rwanda, Zaire, and Uganda, who face an uncertain future and who lack the basic necessities of life. O oh God, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, Give govern the hearts and minds of those in authority, and bring the families of the nation, divided and torn apart by the ravages of violence and injustice, to be subject to his just and gentle rule, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God, our Creator, you have made us one with this earth, tended and to bring forth fruit. May we so respect and cherish all that has life from you, that we may share in the labor of all creation to give birth to your hidden glory through Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy.
words and does something about them. It's like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. A rock. A rock on the rock. Rock, rock. Who's that? A wise man building his house upon a rock. Rock on, Tommy. He built slowly and carefully. Steadily and firmly. First, the foundations. Then, more foundations. Then, more foundations. And finally, he built himself a cave. <laughs> and got ourselves a new white man. Who built slowly and carefully. Steadily and firmly. Meanwhile, back on the beach, there was a foolish man. Who? He was like a person who hears what Jesus says and does nothing about it. He has plenty of ideas about buildings. Oh, yeah, a lot of know-how. Plenty of experience. Many kinds of experience. Mm -hmm. He was open-minded, broad-minded, clear-sighted, hard-headed, but not hard up. He had a finger in every pie and a head in every pudding. And so he built his house on the sand. Because it was the nearest. And planned to rent it out. To a fat profit. No, no. <laughs> <laughs>
in choosing the date for this Jubilee celebration. The day that we have chosen to commemorate is the day when the first piece of turf was actually dug over, <laughs> dug over to make way for the new houses. And of course, we will be reading the advertiser of the great search that's been going on the way, led by Jeff Boyce, to try and find the spade that was used to first dig over those first few clods of earth. Because we marked the beginning of building, not by putting something up, but by digging down, making foundations. Now, we can sometimes think that we owe this approach to building to Jesus. And if he hadn't have told us the story of those two builders, we'd never worked it out. But you know, Jesus didn't come to earth to teach people to build houses. He didn't kind of come along that day and suddenly solve a great problem. You know, they kind of went to, so that's why all our houses have been falling down, Jesus. You never knew that we were supposed to build them on rocks. They already knew that. They'd been building our houses on rock for years. And Jesus actually used an illustration that would have been incredibly familiar to everybody. And he said, you know, you people, when you build a house, you would be crazy if you built it on sand, wouldn't you? And they all said, yeah, that would be a daft thing to do. We need to build it on rock. And Jesus said, you are that crazy if you don't listen to my words and do something about them. And that was the point of Jesus telling the story of the wise and foolish builders. Not so that we would build better houses, but to help us to build better lives. Now it's interesting that when we look around our community, we can see how that principle which Jesus taught us has been put into practice. To be a people who hear the words of Jesus and do something about them. And there are many examples in our community of where Jesus' words have been put into practice. <clears throat> An obvious example is the churches, where we are seeking to become a community of people who put into practice what Jesus has taught us. But there are other places too. For example, we have an organisation called New Addington Good Samaritans. And they take their title from the words of Jesus, because it was Jesus who first invented the phrase Good Samaritan when he told a story about such a person. Or well, another organisation like Toc H, who, although perhaps not such a prominent organisation today, certainly earlier on in the life of our community, were instrumental in working amongst many of the things that now have taken on their own identity and almost are surviving on their own. And Toc H is an organization who have for their motto, let your light shine before men that they may see God's works and glorify your Father in heaven. Words first spoken by Jesus. As a community, we have sought to take the words of Jesus and to put them into practice. And it's by doing that that we will build a strong and successful community. But I want us to take a moment to think about those two builders this morning and just to draw two quick points from the story. The first is this, that the man who is described as the wise builder chose the most difficult option. Most of us, I'm sure, have been down to the seaside at some point and know how easy it is to dig in sand. And most of us also probably know to our delight that New Arlington is built on clay and know how difficult it is to dig our gardens. Building, digging into rock is a very difficult, arduous process, especially in the days of Jesus when they didn't have JCBs and things to help them. The wise man chose the most difficult option. It would have been a lot less work a lot less effort if he'd have built on the sand. And you know, sometimes following God's way can be the tough option. Often, it's easier to criticize than to seek to understand. It's easier to look after number one rather than to invest our time and our efforts in helping the needs of others. Often, it can be very hard work maintaining the things that make our community strong. 
And it's been my privilege in the two years that I've lived here, not only to be working with the churches, but also to be involved with the ACA, with the POPIN, with the Central Parade Committee, with local schools and other people, and see the huge amount of work that goes on in seeking to build our community and make it what it is. And like the wise man who built up the rock, those who work so hard in those organisations have chosen a tough option. It would be so much easier at times, perhaps, just to look at the number one. But these things are essential if our community is to remain strong. We have put Jesus' teaching into practice. But you know, some parts of Jesus' teaching are easier to obey than others. And sometimes it can be a tough option to live by the standards and the teaching of God's word. But Jesus says, don't just take bits of it. Take my words, take them seriously, and do something about them. Because though it's a tough option, it's a rewarding option. The second thing that I want us to learn from the story of is this. But it was in adversity that the difference between the two houses was revealed. After the two builders had finished making their houses, you could look at them and say that there was no difference whatsoever between them. The one on the sand, the one on the rock, both looked the same. And for a few days, no doubt, they were both fine. It was only when the rain came, when the floods came, when the storms came, that we suddenly <coughs> did distinguish the efforts of the two builders. Until that point, you may have been tempted to say that the builder who built up the rock had wasted his time. After all, his house looked no better than that of the foolish man who built it on the sand. But when adversity came, when the storms came, when trouble came, then the test showed who had made the best choice. And equally, the real test of our community is not how we cope when things are going well, but how we cope when things are tough. Many would argue that New Addington has had to cope with more than its fair share of adversity in its 60 years' history. Very often, we have been portrayed in a very different light and very unfairly so. And in our individual lives, we've often had to cope with an awful lot. Perhaps unemployment, family difficulties, or other problems. But we must never let such things become an excuse for letting go of our sense of community. These issues have rightly been recognised as contributing to many of the problems which exist in today's world and today's Britain. But they may be contributors, but they don't have to be causes. And they don't need to be if we refuse to let them. Jesus says, you will weather the storm if you take my teaching seriously. You will be strong if you build your community life and your individual life on the foundations of my words and my teaching. Notice that Jesus doesn't promise that we will avoid the storm. He simply tells us how to survive it. The tough option, the option that helps us stand in hard times, is to build our lives and our community on the words of Jesus. But there's a third point that I would like to make this morning, and it comes not from the story of the two builders, but from another story, part of the Bible, that we read earlier in our service, that comes from Isaiah. And in that passage from Isaiah, we learn that God doesn't want us to build a strong community just for its own sake, but for the sake of others. That passage in Isaiah was written at a time when things for God's people were a bit of a mess. They had been invaded, and they had been driven out of their land, and they were going through the same kind of horrors that the people in Bosnia are suffering at the moment. But God made them a promise. He said, things are going to get better. Things are going to be like they were in the old days. And you're going to be able to rebuild and restore your community. 
But God went one step further. He said, not only will I rebuild you to be what you were, but I will rebuild you so that you can be a source of strength and a source of help to other people. When Angus and I got together to talk about today's service, this was something that he shared with me that's very much on his heart, and I will also resonate. That New Addington is not simply a good place to live, but it has so much to teach other people. Yesterday, we saw hundreds of people, children, mums and dads, aunties, uncles, grandparents, celebrating together in that huge street party that we had. And in a society where we're being told that community and family life is disintegrating, it strikes me that we have something to teach many other parts of our borough and parts of our nation. Uniton doesn't simply deserve equal footing. We actually have a lot to teach others. I wonder if we could have pulled it off yesterday if we'd have been in one of the perhaps more affluent areas of our community. And so let's be proud, because we have every reason to be. And let's not lose sight of what it is that has made our community strong. It is when men and women, ordinary men and women, have sought to put the words of Jesus into practice, have sought to build families, neighborhoods, communities around the teaching of God's word, that community has been made strong. And as we look to the future, as we look to the next 60 years, let's continue to keep our eyes fixed on that goal that we will be a people who are ready to put into practice what God has to say. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing together a hymn which has been written to celebrate our Jubilee. <coughs> to commemorate our diamond jubilee. The tune is one that I'm sure will be familiar to many, although the words may be new. So let's stand and sing together this hymn, for the community, a word of God our Father, who has called us to be his people in this place, to strengthen us to build up the life of this community, and to show forth God's love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. celebration with a coffin, you know. Oh,
要做好我自己。
as clearly exists in New Addington now. So I'm delighted to be here. It has been very great pleasure, and I look forward to giving out the medals, which are so richly deserved by everyone here. Thank you.
Congratulations, young lady. Well done. Yeah, but I don't mind, I'll carry on going. <laughs> Cheers. So I've just been given a small donation to give these two words. So yeah, that's.
and check out this, I want to see you wearing them tomorrow. Slightly wrong. <laughs> 